Good day and welcome to the workshop. My name is Jeff Morrell. I'm from Oregon State University and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about treated wood. As way of background, I'm a, I've, Oregon State has been involved in wood preservation for almost 100 years. We've worked in many different areas of, of protecting wood and we have active sites all along the west coast as well as a large test site uh, in Corvallis. And a lot of that is about making sure wood lasts a lot longer. OSU is one of the leading forestry colleges in, on, in the planet and we're very proud of what we do to help reduce the use of, of waste of wood. Oregon State has had a field test sites since the 1920s, and this is a picture of my predecessor, T.J. Starker, who was one of the first professors of forestry. And it kind of shows you how long it takes to understand what durability is all about and, and sort of the testing that's involved. The test site, you can see it today as it stands, it's the same exact site, and it's been in place for almost 100 years. In order to understand wood preservation, you sort of have to understand the organisms that attack wood. And that would explain why we treat wood. And things we worry about in marine environments are, marine environments are particularly in marine waters, we worry about marine borers. And marine borers are organisms that attack wood in salt water. They're usually mobile. They start off and land on the wood, and then they settle in, and they start to digest and chew up the wood. Shipworms are probably the biggest problem we have along the west coast of the United States. They're, they start off very small and they grow to enormous lengths. They can be up to five feet long and they can chew out the entire inside of a wood. So they're very important along the coast and it's why we have to protect wood in that environment. But we also have other in organisms that attack wood. Insects can be a real problem. Sometimes they get into the wood before the log is even taken out of the woods and then they'll survive to come out in the finished product. And we have to treat wood to protect against those insects. Sometimes Things like ants will attack wood, and they don't really use wood for food, but we have to keep them out anyway, and they, we use preservatives to keep them out as well. But the biggest thing we worry about are fungi. Fungi cause decay. We often talk about dry rot in buildings, but these fungi are the most important agents of degradation of wood, and we worry about them because they can sharply reduce the properties of wood so that it fails catastrophically without warning. And that's why protecting wood is so important. We have lots of different ways to protect wood. One of the oldest ways is to take naturally durable wood species. So we look at things like western red cedar and redwood as species that can last a long time under the right conditions. And we will use them on a regular basis, but we have to understand that their supplies of these materials are limited, and the best material for, old, for, for durable woods is often old growth, and we protect that for other reasons. So we don't have enough naturally durable wood to supply the planet with what we would need. So instead, what we use are treated wood products. And treated wood is just a way of supplementally protecting the wood from decay, many times in the same exact way that a naturally durable wood would perform. The whole treated wood industry in the United States really dates back to the time of the railroads. When the railroads were expanding across the United States, they used enormous quantities of wood that didn't last very long. They would get maybe five years out of a railroad tie and they would be using 3,000 ties per mile of track. So you can imagine the loss of timber that was happening. And people started to get worried about where the timber supply would come from. Theodore Roosevelt was one of the proponents of setting aside forests as the president. He set aside many of our national forests today, and they were totally set aside for utilization so that we'd always have a resource to work with. So he's sort of the father of our national forest in many ways. The benefits of doing this are that we can we can increase our service life. We can make wood last longer if we protect it. We can reduce timber pressure on timber supplies. We can prolong the life and we can, we can make a safer product. And so the benefits of using preservative or naturally durable wood are really obvious because we can reduce the need to harvest additional timber. Now, in order to, to, do, to, to work with preservatives, you need to have good specifications. And a lot of using treatments is about understanding the properties and the organisms and making sure that you have a really good specification that is going to meet the needs of, of the environment it's going to be used in. Also making sure that you have a good quality control system, that you have a way of assessing that you actually got what you purchased, and then some way of looking down the line to look and make sure you maintain the product. Those are really important aspects of using treated wood and using any wood product in general. Now, there are some simple ways of treating wood, and the most common that people think about is brushing on preservatives on the surface of wood. This is not a bad thing to do, 
but it's not very effective. It doesn't penetrate, the preservative doesn't penetrate very far, it sits on the surface, and it really is more of a, a prophylactic treatment that'll protect the wood for a short period of time. Instead, what we look at are pressure treatments. And pressure treatments involve a large metal vessel, which can take pressure in vacuum. And basically what we use is, preserve, we use it to force preservatives inside the wood so that you get much deeper penetration and a deeper protective zone. And that makes the treatment last a lot longer. This is an example of a treating cylinder. And here's an example of sort of a schematic of how treatment works. You have a piece of wood and you add solution or preservative into, a, into the vessel and you apply pressure. And the pressure will force the chemical deep into the wood. And as you add more and more pressure and, and take more time, you'll force the chemical deeper into the wood. And the whole goal of treatment in this case is to create a barrier, a shell that's going to protect the wood for as long as you think it needs to last. Many times it lasts a lot longer than you think, and that's a good thing because that reduces the need to replace wood. At the end of that process, you have a, a preservative shell around a piece of wood that if you protect it properly, will last 40, 50, or 60, or more years in the right, in the right applications. These goals and standards are laid out in American Wood Protection Association standards. And the standards are based on the risk of decay in, or, or marine bore attack in certain environments. And the goal is to, is to match the risk of deterioration with the preservative and the treatment so that you have an optimal com combination of, of characters there. So the AWPA specifications look at the risk of deterioration, they look at the species, they look at the chemicals you might use, and then they lay out certain process limits that you might not want to exceed. Those are more for the treater to work at. And what we use are a series of maps that are risk-based, risk and we can look at the risk of decay or the risk of marine borer attack across the entire United States. And, and the goal is to make sure you tailor the treatment <clears throat> to the application you're going to use it for. These are based on prior exposures of treated wood across the country, so they're based on real application data. The AWPA standards are, are what are called consensus standards, and they were developed by people like myself, wood chemical suppliers, wood treaters, to come up with the best approach to protecting wood. And they are really consensus standards, so they're, they're what we view as the best way to get performance of treated wood out. What we use are a number chemicals. For most of the applications we look at, you've got oil-based chemicals or water-based chemicals. Oil-based chemicals are obviously dissolved in some type of an organic solvent or oil. The oldest one we have is creosote, which has been around since the 1830s and is mostly now used for marine, marine applications, railroads, and sometimes bridges. We also have pentachlorophenol, which has uh, been used mostly for utility poles and a little bit of bridges. And then more recently, we have copper naphthenate, which is a preservative used mostly for utility poles and bridges. All three of these work in the right applications. And you have to make sure you specify them so that you're not using them in the wrong places. The waterborne systems are, there's a lot more waterborne systems available. And many of them have really been developed more for the residential applications. But they also work well in industrial environments. Chromated copper arsenate is the oldest wood preservative we have. In, in, as far as waterborns go, it was also developed in the 1930s. And it was widely used for decking and other applications. Now it's mostly used for marine piling uh, in poles and timbers. And it's a combination of copper, chromium, and arsenic. And the copper is really what does the work in terms of a fungicide. Um, ammoniacal copper zinc arsenate is another waterborne chemical that's used for industrial applications, mostly in the western United States. It was developed as a as sort of a substitute for CCA because CCA didn't penetrate very deeply into our wood species. And so they had to find something that worked a little better. ACZA does that because it penetrates more deeply. There are other waterborne systems that are available. The alkaline copper quats, the copper azoles, are also used for wood preservation, mostly for residential applications. But they are approved for many applications in industrial uses. So they can be used. They just aren't as widely used right now. There are lots of other chemicals coming along, though. There's organic preservatives that are water-based that are also being developed. They're not really ready for heavy applica heavy-duty applications yet, but they're coming along. Mostly when you look at preservatives, you're looking at preservative penetration. And there's a good example of the differences uh, between CCA and ACZA. 
CCA is an acidic system, and it doesn't penetrate very far into some woods. And the picture that you see is a picture of Sitka spruce treated, and these are matched pieces of wood, one treated with CCA and one treated with ACZA. You can see the benefits of using ammonia on some wood species, which is why that's an important application. It's important to understand, though, that all these preservatives are toxic. We understand that because in order to work, they have to be able to keep organisms from attacking wood. And so it's really important to use them properly. The EPA labels are, are quite strict in using preservatives for wood, but the wood itself is not labeled. It's not a labeled product. <clears throat> it's just something that you use. But you want to follow the instructions that are given to you in terms of how to handle the wood. So we have a lot of different preservatives that we can use, and it's important to choose the right chemical for the right application. It's also important to understand sort of how things work in wood. And what I've shown here is a, is a micrograph of a piece of southern pine. And what you see are wood cells with big pores in the middle. And that's, in, in essence, where the water moves in the live tree. But it's where we put preservatives at the same time. So our goal, really, is to sort of fill the lumens with some type of preservative that's going to protect the wood for as long as we want. When we look at quality, what we want to do is measure that treatment. And the way we measure it are usually by taking cores or samples from the wood and measuring the amount of preservative that's penetrated in. So we can measure the preservative. We can actually see it in many cases. And then we take a little bits of that wood and we analyze it so we can tell how much chemical is there. Because we want to make sure that we've got a good barrier of treatment on the outside of the wood. But we also want to make sure there's enough chemical in it to make it work. And so our whole goal is to make sure we choose the right chemical, that we impregnate it properly, and that we have good quality control to make sure that everything is, is exactly where it's going to be so that it performs. Because in many cases, when you look at using wood or any wood product, any, any product in construction, the cost of the materials is actually relatively small. It's the cost of the, of the construction that really adds up. So you want to make sure you have quality when you're putting materials in. Preservatives work really well, but there's a number of things that treatment doesn't really do. When you're looking at wood, wood is a really variable material. And, and you, so you expect to see variation in the treatment results as well. And what, it, what we can't do when we treat wood is we can't determine the absolute amount that's going to be in the wood. So you'll see variation between some, some that have a lot of chemical and some that have a little chemical. And that's just a function of the biology of the wood, the permeability, and the receptivity to chemicals. And we have to accept that. The other thing we understand is that all of the preservatives that were used that are used currently have some water solubility. And so they have the ability to move in the wood. And that's really important because in order to, to work, they have to be available to an organism that's attacking the wood. And that means that they have to be somewhat soluble. They're really not that soluble. They're really very low water solubility, but they will always be able to move. And that's really important. And so you'll never fix the chemical completely in the wood. And then the other problem we have sometimes is that when we treat wood, as we release the pressure, some of the chemical will come out on the surface. And that can be deposited as surface deposits. And so we, can, we don't absolutely clean the wood when we normally treat with wood. And that's why we worry about processing and why we have the best management practices, which we're going to talk about later. But they're a really important part of making sure that what you treat is it has a minimal risk of moving out in the environment, because that's really the goal. The goal is to keep as much chemical in the wood as possible, because that will make the wood last a lot longer and reduce its potential environmental impacts. So our goal here is to select the right chemical, make sure we impregnate it properly, make sure that, it's quality, that the quality is there, and that we clean up the surfaces so that we have minimal environmental impacts. And if we do that right, then preservative-treated wood generally has very little environmental impact.